just two words to welcome you all here this evening to this round table. Um, we try to make it literally a round table. In fact, ideally, we would have had a round table that filled the whole of the penthouse that you could all sit around. This is the nearest we came, but you can see it's not a panel in the classic sense, right? I mean, we're going to introduce extremely briefly and then over to you. And it's really meant to be an exchange of views, students, faculty, the rectors very kindly joined us, um, Professor Baldini from the University of Bologna. So it really is intended to be an exchange of views on this very pressing issue. And we're very uh, fortunate this evening in having uh, Marian Mosama to chair the session. And without more ado, I'll hand over to her, Marian. Thank you so much, Professor. <laughs> Um, dear audience in the room and online, welcome to a conversation a roundtable today about the um, European Parliament elections, which are scheduled to be held from the 6th to the 9th of June 2024. This marks the 10th direct election since 1979 and the first one after Brexit. The elections take place every five years by universal adult suffrage, with more than 400 million people eligible to vote. They are the largest transnational elections in the world. Following the EP elections, the European Parliament elections, the Parliament will vote to elect the new head of the European Commission, the EU's executive body, and to approve the full team of commissioners. 705 MEPs are elected to the European Parliament, which makes it the only EU institution to be directly elected. While European political parties have the right to campaign EU-wide for European elections, campaigns still take place through national election campaigns, advertising national delegates from national parties. As an EU citizen, you can vote in your country of origin from abroad or in the country you live in. Now, why should we in the room as future policymakers care about these elections and what is at stake? The European Parliament elections in 27 countries this June may produce a lurch to the populist Eurosceptic right. So what would this signify for the EU's next leaders and its flagship projects, such as on climate, security, and defense, amid state and global risks? Should Europe's allies be concerned? I'm honored to welcome tonight's distinguished and well-known panelists who will proceed to do their opening remarks in their respective fields of expertise after which we will engage in a lively discussion with everyone in the room and online. Thank you. May I hand the floor, first of all, to Professor Gilbert. Thank you, thank you very much indeed. Uh, right, five minutes, you said? Okay. I have been briefed to be very strict on the five minutes. Be very, <laughs> I have very been strict. given a little bell, so I will be <laughs> announcing the five, five minutes. It's going to be very over. difficult for me to talk for five minutes, but uh, I'll do my best. Uh, European Parliament, well, I can't vote for it. Uh, <laughs> I've never taken out Italian citizenship. I probably should have done, despite the fact I pay uh, taxes in Europe. And despite the fact that I pay taxes in Italy, uh, the uh, idea of the European Parliament, as its name it was originally called the European Assembly, right? And it was because there was an enormous push that it should become a parliament in the context of uh, federalist ideas about European unification. Uh, David, when I was back as an undergraduate, one of the first books I read was David Marquand's uh, the, A Parliament for Europe. It's a very, very good book. It's still, not, in some ways, not being surpassed. And he made the arguments for a European Parliament. And I actually had a look at this, going all the way back to 1979, first parliamentary elections, to see why people thought a European Parliament was a good idea, because there's essentially the same argument he needs to make. Basically, an assembly of national politicians, which was what the EC had, was believed to be inadequate. You had to have a parliament that was composed of people who were being European, not being British or Luxembourgeois or Belgian or French or whatever. Uh, there was a need for an assembly that put the common good of Europe first in order that the policies of the EU had democratic legitimacy. Uh, 
And these were the ideas underpinning the decision to have an elected parliament in 1979. Now, I was talking to the director at lunch today, so I'm giving him credit for pointing this out, but it's true that the one European institution which very steadily has been accruing uh, responsibilities since 1979 has been the European Parliament. And, uh, as, I say, as I say, it was an elected assembly. It was an unelected assembly. Parliamentary delegates. Uh, it wasn't even really, a, it wasn't called a parliament until 1979. Single European Act, 1986. Treaty on European Union, 1992. Lisbon Treaty, 2007. Various treaties in between. The European Parliament gradually acquires more powers. In particular, co-decision, the ability to act as a legislature, a, a second legislature along with the Council of Ministers in the European Community. It has parity with the European with the Council of Ministers now, in effect. That's why we have a European Parliament, because Europe takes big decisions and it needs democrat democratic legitimization. That's the argument. How well does it do this? Well, you know, despite what we've just heard, it doesn't really express a government. Parliaments or governments are supposed to emerge, right? Whoever gets a majority in parliament should form a government in the parliamentary system. It doesn't do this. Uh, I think it can be criticized, and this is something my fellow panelists are likely to have views on, for not acting as a forum the public debate. No, the House of Commons, if you ever watch it on the television, it's embarrassing frequently. It's raucous, almost invariably. It is still, even today, the place that commands the attention of British public debate. That doesn't happen with the European Parliament for very good reasons, obvious reasons as well. Uh, and just one last final point. I've been very quick. But I did want to say this. I'm going to raise a slightly provocative and paradoxical comment. You were saying, Marin, that uh, what will happen if all these right wing parties and uh, populist parties start to emerge as challenges to the traditional Christian Democrat, Social Democrat, liberal parties which have supported European integration? I don't think that will be a bad thing, because it will mean that the Parliament is doing what a Parliament should do, reflecting the, the electorate that voted for it, providing representation within, within the parliamentary hemisphere, and, and ensuring that public debate can take place. Now, <laughs> you're asking me, do I want uh, Le Pen and uh, Orban to get a majority? No, I don't. Do I think that you should be re represented? Is it likely to give a jolt in the arm to the European Parliament? Possibly, yes. These elections might actually provide us with an authentic European Parliament. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Gilbert. Um, I will directly hand over to Professor Frizzini if I'm um, allowed. No. The floor is yours. You are allowed, yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, while Mark still cannot uh, vote in uh, European parliamentary elections, I'm doing my very best to get my documentation together to be able to vote in the next British election uh, because they finally lifted the 15-year uh, uh, limit in terms of residency, which might have made a difference in the Brexit referendum in 2016. Now, I'm going to pick up on where uh, Mark uh, uh, ended. Um, obviously, uh, from a strictly legal point of view, if I were a black letter lawyer, I would tell you, with each treaty, we have had a uh, increase in the uh, powers that have been given to the European Parliament. Uh, I agree completely with, with Mark on the fact that the story of European integration is not all... Uh, uh, moving forward, all positive, what we might call a, a weak history of continuous development. There have been lots of moments where European integration stalled, the empty uh, chair crisis and so on and so forth. But there is one thing where we do see a constant, and that is in the powers that are given 
uh, to the uh, European Parliament. Um, Mark talks about it being the second ledger. It's it's a co it's a co legislator in a bicameral uh, lawmaking system today. That is uh, that is how it how it works. Um, and this was not the case once upon a time. It was first called an assembly and then a parliament, but it did not have the lawmaking uh, powers to, to begin with, but it does now. It also has important supervisory powers. It also has, since 1975, control over the expenditure of the commission. This became very important in the fall of the Santé Commission in 1999 because of misuse of uh, funding on the part of that commission. But the thing that I would un underline the most is the following. And here, I don't want to go to the other extreme and say, yes, the European Parliament expresses a confidence towards a government. Uh, to define the European Commission, a government, it's probably still in fear, in progress, as it were. However, we are getting ever closer. One, 1999, the fall of the Santé Commission was because we'd had the Amsterdam Treaty that gave the possibility to the European Parliament to approve motions of censor. And although a motion of censor was never approved in Parliament, Santé had to resign. Case number two, very interesting, the formation of the José Barroso uh, Commission in 2004. Uh, the Parliament threatened to use uh, its power to block a commissioner delegate because of uh, 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 ideas that they had expressed during the hearings. This was the a person that had been appointed by the then Berlusconi government, Rocco Buttiglione, who expressed uh, controversial opinions on uh, same-sex marriage, the role of women in society, and so on and so forth. And it became very clear that a majority in Parliament would not support that commissioner, and indeed Italy had to indicate a new, uh, a new commissioner. This actually also had a fun anecdote to it, because it meant that when the Second Rome Treaty was signed, the Constitutional Treaty, Berlusconi was hoping to be on his own hosting this great event, and because of the delay in the formation of the Barroso Commission, he found that he had to do, he had to share the scene and share the uh, uh, the stage with Romano Prodi, um, and this certainly did not uh, uh, please him at all. But question to all of you: 2019. I'm not going to touch on the Spitzenkandidat because that's something that uh, our rector will talk about. But in 2019, how many commissioner delegates were? blocked by the European Parliament. Three. And that is not a indifferent number. That means that the Parliament is playing a role. The lion's role in, in determining the composition of the commission, maybe not, but it is playing a big political role. Two commissioners, a Hungarian and a Romanian, were blocked immediately, and the two respective governments had to find replacements and then during the hearings at a certain point a conflict of interest emerged with regard to Goulard and she was uh, forced to be replaced by uh, Macron and from a political point of view that is not uh, a secondary thing to happen with all respect if I may for Romania and Hungary don't misinterpret me all of you but certainly to say no to a commissioner that has been appointed by France a fairly famous economist like Sylvie Goulard was, was a pretty important uh, move made by Parliament. Were these motions of censor always voted? No, but this is typically even in a national uh, context. You don't necessarily have to get to the formal moment of voting, no confidence towards the government, to be able to provoke a government crisis. Italy is an example. Gianfranco could tell you a lot about this, but also Britain has only had one a uh, motion of no, uh, no confidence to bring down a government. I will stop here. Maybe during the Q&A, I will also mention the significance of the electoral system that is used to vote for the European Parliament, but that we can talk about maybe later on. Thank you very much, Professor Frosini. Um, I will hand over now to Rector de Roos, who will elaborate on the lead candidate arrangement or Spitzenkandidat with the interview. <laughs> yes, as one says, in plural speak. Well, uh, I think there's a nice continuity in uh, what has been said by uh, the, the two colleagues who started first. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, I will try to argue in my five minutes that uh, uh, simply said, uh, 
it makes sense to vote in European elections because uh, it, it's a way to influence uh, decisions that are made at the European level. Um, and the, the, the chain of command works better than uh, one uh, tends to believe. Uh, but but it's taken a certain time to build uh, this, uh, this system. It's fair to say that when the first European elections were held, the result uh, was far from responding to the expectations of the promoters of the system. Because basically, uh, it turned out that because the elections were contested by uh, on a national scale by national parties, they tended to focus on national issues. And as a result, uh, you, you had a, a gigantic, uh, let's say, opinion poll on the popularity of governments in place, uh, which often resulted in their uh, defeat. I mean, very uh, learned political scientists have shown that uh, basically, if you had been in office for more than one year, the chances of being defeated in the European elections were high, exactly like at, uh, on the occasion of the midterm elections in the US. Um, yet, things have been changing. I'm not saying that this has disappeared. I, I'm saying that we now uh, are witnessing something else, which is often uh, what happens at the European level. You have innovations that are introduced, but they don't uh, produce effects until uh, a, a number of years have elapsed, and also un until uh, a, a number of elections have taken place. It's also well known uh, phenomenon in uh, electoral studies that when you change electoral systems, the results are not felt on the first uh, opportunity, but uh, when uh, voters learn basically the, the consequences of, of, of their uh, choices. And that's more or less what happened. I mean, the, the trick uh, can be, uh, let's say, uh, located in a, a, a a call uh, that was made 25 years ago by uh, former uh, Commission President Jacques Delors, who said, well, very simply, the system as it is, is perfectly compatible with the idea that European not national parties would uh, nominate their candidate for the top job, the top job being uh, the presidency of the Commission. And this person would campaign uh, across uh, the uh, European Union, and therefore would be fo forced to focus on European and not merely national issues. When in 1999 the law launched this call for uh, uh, this radical move, it, it was listened to politely but not followed by any uh, of the parties. Things changed, however, uh, in 2014 for the first time. And why is that? Well, for all sorts of reasons, discontent with uh, the, the result of previous election rounds, but also the fact that one of uh, those who wanted to compete for the top job, the then president of the European Parliament, Martin Schulz, knew full well that he would not be proposed by any one of the governments in place. So his only chance of uh, acceding to the top position was through the electoral channels, and therefore he pushed. Uh, for uh, the implementation of the Delors design, uh, got the green line from his own party, the Socialist Party, and then the, the competitive logics of uh, politics made it unavoidable, even for those parties who did not subscribe to the idea of a lead candidate, a Spitzenkandidat, mm -hmm. as the system is known in the uh, uh, German, uh, in the German electoral system, uh, or even those countries who did not subscribe to that idea, say, well, we can't leave the political field unoccupied. We need our champion to compete uh, uh, with Martin Schulz and the others. And there was a kind of domino effect, which led well, not to show selection, uh, his party failed to uh, to get as many seats at, uh, as it, he had hoped. Uh, it's uh, actually the European People's Party uh, that got the largest number of seats uh, on the location. And therefore, uh, the European People's Party candidate uh, who was selected to uh, become the Commission president, this despite the fact that within his own party, a large number of people, uh, including Angela Merkel, 
very powerful uh, German chancellor, and Hermann van Rompuy, then president of the European Council, so no uh, small uh, character on the European scene. All these people were opposed, and yet Juncker prevailed, which shows that there was a, a kind of logic in the system. And that's the interesting point. It did not stop there at the uh, with the choice of the Commission president. If you look at the Commission's program, you will see that the Juncker Commission had a program which very much looked like that of uh, the candidate Juncker. And that even the structure of the Commission was changed in order to have groups of commissioners uh, who would focus on the main point of the, uh, of the presidential program, which triggered, of course, a kind of uh, a creeping presidentialization uh, in uh, the institution, but that's another story. What happened subsequently is interesting because, uh, as everybody knows, Ursula von der Leyen was not the Spitzenkandidat, and yet she became commission president, which led very many people to say we're well, out of uh, the idea of uh, an indirect choice of uh, the commission president. But I think it's uh, things are more complicated than that. If you look at the substance, what did von der Leyen do uh, when she was parachuted in Brussels uh, against all law? Because uh, nobody really thought of her as a, a candidate for that position. Well, she had one week to find uh, a majority in parliament. So what did she do? She, she uh, basically engaged in a conversation with uh, the parliamentary groups and uh, took note of the fact that uh, on that occasion, there was uh, a, a large shift in favor of green parties in Russia. Hence, uh, the number one item on her agenda is climate change and uh, the launching of a climate, uh, uh, a green deal at, at the European level. You know that uh, the temperature, if, if, if I may dare this kind of metaphor, uh, has uh, changed now at uh, the European level, and there is a big push uh, towards, let's say, slowing down uh, on the implementation of the Green Deal, because there's a big uh, distributive issue, who is going to pay for all this? And we've seen farmers in the streets uh, uh, to protest uh, against the cost that they had to pay, which leaves the European People's Party to now uh, advocate a pushback and, and slowing down on, on the delivery. You might say it's a dangerous evolution, but seen in political terms, it's an interesting evolution because it shows that you have political leaders who are listening, listening to what uh, uh, citizens and voters have to say. And if uh, indeed uh, a large and a vocal uh, number of uh, uh, citizens complain about the policies uh, decided in Brussels, then they have the opportunity to vote. So my bet would be that uh, we will see a lot of these uh, Europeanized discussions. And we will see, despite the fact that in Italy, for instance, uh, the big issue seems to be whether uh, the prime minister uh, will uh, be a candidate in, in all constituencies, I think you will see a gradual emergence of uh, uh, pan-European issues and debates. And that's exactly uh, what the parliament and the elections were created for. I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you again. <laughs> um, I will now hand over to Hannah Gesang. She's a Maya candidate here at Size Europe, um, and she focuses on European politics. Yes. Um, so I'm going to be speaking a little bit about the role of the uh, role of young people in these elections. And this is this is obviously not like a monolithic group. Uh, member state and socioeconomic background are just two really important points uh, that determine how you vote, even if you vote. Uh, I assure that those of you who are part of this group already care about it, and I'm going to try to make an argument to everybody else why you should also be caring about this blurry group of voters. Um, they are kind of harder to capture than other groups because they tend to determine quite last minute who they will vote for. But in the EU elections in 2019, they played an enormous role. Um, so it was the highest turnout ever since 1994. And the vote of young people, those under 25, increased by 14 percentage points. And that's a significant reversal from what was previously more of a period of abstentionism. 
Um, the EU has been spending time and also your taxpayer money on keeping it that way. The Conference of the Future of Europe, for example, but also if you've been traveling around uh, Europe, you will have seen the PR campaign surrounding the Green New Deal. Um, there's also been some legislative action in Belgium, Malta, Austria, and very recently now also Germany, 16 year olds can vote. And in, in Greece, it's uh, 17 year olds. And the obvious follow up question is then like, how are they going to vote, right? And whoever can prophesy that may now have my residual speaking time. But it's you mean you can't, I can't either. Um, I already said statistically, it's a group that's hard to capture. Um, the common assumption I want to dispel is that uh, when like many uh, uh, high turnout of young people is going to be a high turnout for the left wing. That's going to be a win for them somehow. That's just not true anymore. Across Europe and national and also local elections, we've been seeing young people voting for the right wing as well, and sometimes significantly so. Uh, in the Netherlands, uh, Gerhard Wilders claimed the largest share of voters between 18 and 34 years old. Um, so some factors that political scientists have been naming are economic concerns, and that definitely outweighs the xenophobia. Um, precariousness of the youth labor market is really important, so it's the housing crisis in, in many of Europe's largest cities, and also experience of instability, for example, through COVID-19 matter. I also read something interesting on the normalization phenomenon, I'll be interested to hear inputs, that there's just less stigmatization of voting for the right wing, because we've been growing up uh, seeing right wing um, parties in the landscape. And there's also gender gap. Young men are increasingly conservative, young women are increasingly liberal, and that's a worldwide phenomenon. That's not something just in the EU. So clearly, there is a possibility here for the right wing to garner the youth vote. Campaigners on one side of the political spectrum have also understood that. And I'm going to do a little bit of a case study from my home country, Germany, uh, because it's the one I know best, and it's also the EU's most populous. Um, the AFD, the Alternative for Germany, is conducting a campaign geared, those six, geared towards those 16 and 17 year old first time voters on TikTok. Very briefly, the TikTok algorithm works in a way where you don't have to seek out content. Any given video that's uploaded is shown randomly to a number of people. If it's then watched or liked, uh, it's shown further. Right. And so it doesn't matter if you agree with something that you see, it can disseminate just because it's a polarizing, simple message that keeps people watching. And consequently, the lead candidate of the AFD in Germany called Maximilian Krah has been going viral quite regularly. His videos are catered mostly towards young men. Uh, some quotes include uh, real men are right wing and patriotic. And also actual quote, there is no need to be kind of weak and left wing to get a girlfriend. And <laughs> It, that sounds really stupid, but these videos get millions of clicks. And there's also a complete failure of other parties at the same time. The TikTok videos posted by the AFD parliamentary faction are reaching about 10 times more viewers than all the other parties combined. So this space is left entirely to the right wing. And there doesn't seem to be another party capable of distilling their messages in a way that's attractive to these young voters. My conclusion is obviously not that views on TikTok in Germany are predictive for voting behavior, neither in Germany and most certainly not across all of the EU. But I think this case study suggests that right wing parties are avant garde in this kind of campaigning and they, they are reaching out to this significant vote. Um, and I'm going to be curious to hear your opinion on this. But in my opinion, if the right wing ends up garnering a lot of the youth vote, then the other parties are also at fault because of this failure. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, I would like to hand over the floor to Professor Lee, and um, he will speak about the impact of the elections on general EU politics and wider policies. Thank you. Thanks very much, Marian. Well, in my five minutes, three main points. First, the outgoing uh, European Commission, led by the German Christian Democrat Ursula von der Leyen, has been the most dynamic and active, in my view, since Jacques Delors' commission in the 1980s and 1990s, albeit in a period of uh, polycrisis, as it's been called, and war. Secondly, the European elections will see a rise of far-right Eurosceptic parties, mainly at the expense of socialists, liberals, and greens, according to opinion polls, 
And thirdly, the next commission will struggle to maintain the flagship policies of the last five years. Diving a little bit deeper, these years have really marked a, a very active phase. What we've seen in this period, the top priorities of the van der Leyen Commission, as the Rector has said, has been the European Green Deal, the fight against climate change, controlling big tech, where there have been many innovations, the first um, AI act uh, in the world, um, reducing dependence on unreliable supply chains. The Commission has even managed to pull off a trade agreement uh, post-Brexit with the country that I used to know best, um, then uh, to adapt it uh, to ensure that there were no uh, excessive border controls um, in the Irish Sea. So the first time ever, uh, the European Commission obtained permission to issue debt, to raise money on European capital markets. Previously, it had to have a balanced budget and to rely on its own resources. And this was used, as you will remember, uh, to finance um, recovery from the pandemic. So as we heard a couple of weeks ago from Tito Boyeri, um, this hasn't always gone to plan or been used to the best purpose. The Commission, what else has it achieved? It's raised public health policy, previously mainly a national responsibility to the EU level, with a massive program to buy vaccines. And it responded to Russian uh, attack on Ukraine by starting the first ever EU scheme to buy lethal weapons, Europe's peace project, right? So this was a true breakthrough. It provided a large amount of uh, financial assistance, economic assistance to Ukraine at a time when this was blocked in the US, overcoming objections from Viktor Orban. And in record time, it opened uh, the process leading eventually to the possible accession to the EU as members of Ukraine, um, Moldova, and Georgia. The EU during this period has imposed more than 12 rounds of sanctions on Russia and maintained a consensus to do so. So this, and it's my second point, um, raises the question, will the coming European Parliament election and, this, and especially the rise of Eurosceptic parties, some of which are also pro-Moscow parties, um, put all of this achievement into doubt. As the rectors mentioned, there's already talk about a pause. I love the word pause. Will it be a pause or will it be longer in the European Green Deal amidst fears that the farmers' demonstrations that we're seeing um, could mirror the French yellow jacket protests of 2018, 2019, with all uh, their, their consequences. Uh, von der Leyen tried to postpone the opening of accession negotiations with Ukraine for fear that this would prove unpopular ahead of the European Parliament elections. But there were protests, particularly in Eastern Europe, and indeed this month, the negotiations are going to open on schedule um, in any event. There's already pushback in Germany and in the frugal Northern European countries against plans to use the COVID model of raising funds on capital markets to, to buy weapons in the future. So let's see what comes of that. Von der Leyen was chosen last week at the EPP's uh, Congress in Bucharest as the Spitzenkandidat um, for the European People's Party the center-right party, but by an extremely narrow margin. And a considerable number of delegates at that conference either did not vote or voted against her. The prospects now um, for her after the elections, when she would have to be confirmed by the European Parliament, uh, really remain to be seen. Many in the European People's Party, including its president, Manfred Weber, lean towards the far right, which is expecting to make major gains. And they are more inclined towards outreach to some of the parties on the right um, as possible support in the new parliament. There are two main groups on, on the right, on the further right, the European Conservatives and Reformist Group, the ECR, chaired by Georgia Meloni and including her own Brothers of Italy party, um, which could become the fourth 
group in size in the European Parliament, taking over from the Liberals. Um, the ECR may have its eye on the chair of the presidency of the European Parliament after the election. The other far-right party, which began as a breakaway group from the ECR, the Identity and Democracy, ID group, um, is likely to increase the number of seats by 40 uh, in the election, according to present uh, projections. This is the party that includes uh, the Lega, the Alternative for Germany, and the National Rally in France. If ECR and ID could get together, then after the elections, they would be the largest group in the European Parliament. Mm -hmm. But one of the main things about nationalists is they see the world in their own way, and they find it hard to get on to each other, with each other, fortunately, for the rest of us. <laughs> so this is likely to dilute the pro-European uh, party, uh, EPP's uh, typical uh, mm -hmm. policies. Just the same, my final point, the EPP will remain as the largest party in the European Parliament. It will continue to dominate the European Commission, where at present it has 11 commissioners out of 27, and it will continue to dominate the European Council, where it also, after yesterday's Portuguese election, has 11 heads of government out of 27. So my final point, I think that um, the institutions going forward are likely to have different policies from the ones that we've seen over the last five years. And even if Ursula von der Leyen is approved by the European Council and then squeaks through the European Parliament, she's likely to be singing a different tune in the years ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I will now hand over to Professor Baldini, who is an Associate Professor of Political Science at the University of Bologna. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's always great to be here. So I had basically to change my two or three points every time I was listening to my colleagues. So I tried to make up my mind and say something uh, which makes sense, hopefully. So the first point which comes to my mind when we talk about Italy and the European election is a point about turnout, which is basically one of the points of the second order election, which is hanging over the room, even if it's not been specifically mentioned so far. So the idea is basically that citizens go to the poll in, a, in, a, in ways that is much less numerous than when they have general elections. And this has been affecting the way in which European institutions have tried to build a stronger legitimacy, especially over the last 10 years. Now, Italy used to be a country where uh, people would go to the polls in high numbers, especially during the so-called First Republic. They no longer do so, and uh, the last time it was only slightly more than 50%, which is more or less the European average, whereas in former times it used to be much higher. So on this point, on turnout, I think we still need to focus as people studying politics because it's an important uh, it's an important thing to understand that, you know, if people don't go to the polls, of course, the legitimacy of the institution is somehow affected. My second point was about the, um, um, the way in which European elections used to be interpreted in Italian politics, which is also an important point, because if we look back 10 years, we see that uh, except for the UK, where, of course, the 2019 ex elections um, had to be held in order to get Brexit implemented, the European elections have had huge consequences for Italian governments, in the sense that they have uh, twice been misjudged in many ways because of the massive votes that first uh, Matteo Renzi got in 2014, which he basically interpreted as, as a vote of confidence on him, and uh, because Renzi, if you recall, had been just uh, sworn in government since uh, three months, more or less, when we had uh, the elections in 2014, and he went on to interpret the 40 percent as, you know, a, a vote of confidence of him. Basically, he went up, you know, to try to reform the institutions and to think that that was like a political vote, which it wasn't, basically. So uh, that was a point, I think, that uh, needs to be remembered. Five years on, Matteo Salvini does more or less the same, even if in different circumstances. He was the junior partner of the Conte One government, and basically he interprets the 34% of the league as you know, a, a means to be put on the table to, to assess his power and to have full powers, as you basically said, a few weeks after that vote. And in this case too, uh, much more quickly, this turned out against him. So 
the election was misinterpreted as a huge vote for the league, which it was in many ways, but it was a European vote, which was not, of course, again, a general election vote. So what can we expect now? Of course, now things are different because, as it has just been said, we have a government that has been in for 15 months, basically, and the opinion polls would not see any kind, at least so far, of huge change in terms of the political equilibrium between the different parties. So, uh, of course, it's, it's too soon to say, and, uh, but what we can say from opinion polls is that now there is going to be two games in the interpretation of the balance of power between the parties in government. And again, the opinion polls would tell us that um, not, not much would change if, if the results remain the same as they are now in opinion polls. But the, the most important thing perhaps is for the opposition because European elections being hold on, on a proportional representation. Again, there is the danger that the parties that get good votes as possibly can be for the PD or the Five Star Movement would interpret this again as you know a vote for them in the future general election, which of course is, is again not the same thing. Uh, moving to the ambitions that uh, Meloni, President Meloni has had since she has become prime minister. This is also an important point that has been already raised. So I will say a few things just to complement what has been said already. Uh, when Meloni became prime minister, and even before that, when she was basically smelling the coffee during summer of 2022, because the opinion boards would put her party long ahead of all the others, she basically uh, tried to reach out to, uh, to members of European People's Party, to, to President Weber, to many others, to try to uh, you know, make a uh, uh, game big in terms of ambitions of, of a party to represent as a sort of a pivot part in terms of the new alliances between the different groups. Now things seem to have somehow changed also because other parties of the, of the European conservative and reformist group that has been quoted before uh, have done not very well in the 2023 elections. And I, I mentioned that the Polish piece and the Fox in Spain. So basically, if we are to judge again from opinion polls, there is this possibility that the two parties that have a right wing or far right parties, which is to say the ID and the CR together would have, you know, like the same seats as the EPP or as the mainstream groups. But again, these votes wouldn't add up. Of course, it's too soon to say whether uh, and what would be actually the composition of these European party groups? Because another thing which hasn't been mentioned is that Viktor Orban has been expelled by the EPP. And so we have a lot to look in terms of uh, these parties, uh, but let's not forget that these parties are divided on important issues such as Russia and also the management of the economy and of the Eurozone more specifically. So there is a lot to be looked at in the next election. And I think that this is, these are going to be important both for the consequences on Italian politics, but especially for the for a possibly a new role of, of President Meloni. But this is be, going to be played in the difficult equilibrium between the different party groups. Thanks. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, we have touched upon a wide, wide range of, of topics ranging from uh, direct elections, the uh, EU's democratic deficit in a historical context, the legal and constitutional aspects, um, the Spitzenkandidat arrangement and, and its future, um, young voters and the rise of the far right, the impact of the elections on general EU politics and the um, more national perspective of Italy on the EU elections. Um, I would like to open the floor to the audience, but before that would make use of my own uh, position as chair and ask, um, a question, um, namely, in terms of the national and supranational character between the European Union and the national member states, um, is the EU doing enough to influence voter turnout and the perception of um, not enough democratic legitimacy in the EU institutions? Um, do we maybe need tricky changes in order to enhance this democratic legitimacy also in the view of, of voters or or do we have um have, have we done enough in in these terms i would like to to ask professor frosini and um and professor gilbert uh in terms of the um 
treaties and 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 the development uh, of those um and and then i would like to to direct um the question further to um to hannah gesang on, on what she may think um about the eu's outreach for these for the for the turnout on the european elections because you said that in 2019 rightfully the, the turnout was was very very big and we wonder how this will will change thank you I think if we were to begin uh, a discussion on treaty treaty amendments, this would have the opposite effect to uh, sort of attracting the interest of, of, of the voters within the uh, within the EU. So I think any any discussion at that level is rather like constitutional reform in Italy. Basta. Uh, let's try. Let's try and do it in some other way. Uh, Hannah's mentioned the the mechanisms that could be used in order to to uh, um, counter what, if I'm not mistaken, what you were talking about is micro uh, micro political uh, uh, targeting, which I'm think you know at national level maybe some measures should be taken against this because. It, it, I think, is pretty worrying. But having said that, um, I don't think that the electoral system that is used for uh, European elections is particularly voter friendly. And I will admit, from this point of view, that I've never been a great fan of proportional representation. I think if we, if we shift it to a different system, however, this would mean some changes in the in the in the legislation at, at EU level. So we get into a bit of a catch-22 situation. But the 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 the, the electoral systems that are used at, at, at national level and the fact that PR has been imposed on all the countries, I think, is, is not particularly positive. One possible solution would be to go down the road uh, that the Spaniards went down with regard to their system of proportional representation, and that is to have it in, sorry if I get into the technical, but to have it in, in small electoral districts where we know who the candidates are. And we need to, to intervene and try to convince the member states, because this these are rules that are up to the member states, to stop it with the so-called pluricandidacy because that is the other problem. If you're elected in a certain electoral district, you need to be elected there and not be a candidate in all five districts. This is gonna happen, John Franco didn't get around to this one, I'm sure he will add this. This is gonna happen in the Italian elections, in all of the of the, the large, extremely large electoral districts for the, for the European parliamentary elections in Italy. We will have at the top, the leaders of the parties, there'll probably be Spitzenkandidato, a capolista, in all the regions, but then they will obviously only be elected in one, and they won't even go if they're prime minister, because Maloney cannot be a member of the European Parliament if uh, uh, if she's uh, if she's Italian prime minister. I've not completely answered your question, Marion, in terms of attracting, but you know, the more the the election campaign is grassroots, the more it's going to involve uh, uh, the voters of the European within the European Union. Thank you very much. Yeah, we have talked about the topic of democratic legitimacy of the EU institutions a lot lately, so that's where my, my question was directed. I don't know if you have anything to add, other, otherwise I will. I, I, I've got something to add, but Candy, do you want to go first? Yeah, yeah sure. Um, so when I was researching this, I was thinking, okay, so why did people come in 2019? Why did I go to vote? But also maybe less politicized people. And it was practically Brexit and the Green New Deal. Those were really big factors. It was things young people really cared about. Mm -hmm. um, I will respond to Professor Fredini that what the AFD is doing is not illegal. So you can't really do anything on national level about it, at least from what I know. Um, but what you should be doing is political competition. Um, that's what other parties should be doing, in my opinion. So if you want a very simple answer, I think they should be speaking about what young people care about. I think that's pretty well known. Um, and also do so in a way that actually reaches them. Local candidates can be helpful, but then young people also tend to not be very active in local elections. So that's another question. The EU has real power, regulatory power. We all benefit from it. I think many people don't know about it. There's that, that disbalance. Um, so I think they need to also let them know what they're already doing uh, for young people in Europe, which is not insignificant. 
Thank you. Well, I'd like to just build off what the other two people said, and thank you for asking me. I think the first thing is low turnout is not particularly surprising. Um, it's a distant parliament based in Brussels, um, which is a long way away from most voters. Look at the US Congress. What's the election turnout in the US Congress where everybody speaks the same language? It's 40 something percent, for example, in the European elections is actually higher. Uh, I don't. I think it's very, very difficult indeed at the risk of betraying my Rousseauian sympathies. I think it's easier to get democracies in small in small communities where everybody knows each other. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one thing. Uh, it's always going to be difficult to mobilize large numbers of people to vote for a faraway parliament. Second thing is, I think the debate, and here I slightly disagree with the rector. I hope I'm allowed to do that. Uh, the, because I... It's true that there has been more transnational debate in recent times and that the elections to the European Parliament have been less a sum of national debates. Mm -hmm. But I still think that this has not taken place on, doesn't take place on a sufficient scale. Maybe that will change. We need more passion in European politics. People really need to get worked up across Europe about the green. New Deal and people in Sweden need to be reacting to what politicians say in Portugal. Will that happen? I don't know. But it's very difficult to get high turnout, which is your question, unless you've got that, uh, that kind of thing. The last point, and here I'm going to go slightly against what Anna was saying, although I, you know, I wouldn't know TikTok if it landed on my head on a brick. Uh, <laughs> but it's these Parties of the right are not just winning and gaining more votes because they're good at using social media. I, 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 I know you say didn't that. say okay. that, I know, but in the great tradition of panel discussions, I wish to parody your, your position <laughs> in order to make my point better. And uh, I'll, I'll give you a little anecdote. I was actually contacted during the European, what's it called, the European debate by the European People's Party. For some reason, they thought I could give them good advice on uh, the way in which to make Europe, Europe more democratic. I had a long conversation with somebody from the European, two people from the European People's Party, and uh, their argument was, how do we communicate to European voters what the Spitzenkandidat is? Uh, I, I responded to them, I don't know that, but I told them the story of my friend Michela Nicoletti, who was going to be a candidate for the uh, Council of Europe, he was going to become president, I think, even of the Council of Europe, he was an Italian deputy for, who had been standing for the European Parliament, for the National Parliament this was, and he had lost unexpectedly to a Lega candidate. and. Uh, I remember reading the newspaper when this happened. Michele, a very well-known person where I live, lost to a candidate from the Lega. And the candidate for the Lega said, well, you know, uh, I don't know what to say, but uh, I never saw any candidates from the PD out about in the streets. Whereas I can tell you, we Lega, we were on the streets 24 hours a day. And I think to a certain extent, these parliaments, this parliament, if there is a vote for the far right, and these parties are very far to the right. I agree with what Michael was saying. I mean, you've got identity and democracy, which includes Lega, uh, Le Pen, uh, the uh, Austrian liberals, once upon a time were regarded as being beyond the pale, liberals inverted commas, uh, the PBV, uh, Dansk uh, Volker Party, and then you've got the European conservatives and reformists, Fratelli uh, d'Italia, Vox, Law and Justice, the Finns Party, the Civic Democrat Party from Prague, and the Swedish Democrats, who were borderline Nazi in some cases, uh, you add these two together, and they are likely to be the largest group. But maybe, question mark, in this great spirit of roundtable being provocative, maybe because, that's because they're working harder. Thank you very much, Professor Gilbert, um, and everyone else who, who kindly answered my question. Um, I would now like to open the floor to, to everyone else. Um, I would like to maybe collect three questions at a time. Um, Professor Pazzini, may, maybe, are there questions um, online? Not for the moment. Not for the moment. Okay. Um, let's collect three questions. Um, it would be great if you could direct them directly at one of the panelists, otherwise we can see who, who, who just answered. Thank you. 
Um, thank you very much for this panel. This has been highly informative. Um, I'd like to stay on the topic of voter turnout before we very quickly diverge from it. So I'll address this to Hannah, uh, Professor DeVoos, and also or Rector DeVoos and Professor Baldini. So given the fact that we have acknowledged that social media, of course, as Professor Gilbert Wiley said, wasn't the only reason the right is gaining popularity. I was curious what the role of national leadership, especially for the far right, so I'd say in Belgium, like Tom Patrick and, and also the Ate leadership emerging. I would, I'm wondering what their role is in mobilizing their voters for the European elections, considering that I don't see equivalents maybe happening with the liberals. And as I'm a brief corollary, um, that's more specifically targeted to Hannah. In, in terms of the liberals trying to get further turnout than the AFD, or I would say any far right European political party, is there a more fruitful strategy in trying to convert these already appeal to voters in Germany who the AFD or any other party have reached first? Or would there be more benefit in mobilizing kind of apathetic liberal voters? So where can these liberal parties direct their efforts more effectively? Thank you, and please introduce yourselves briefly. Um, thank you so much for this panel. It's been really fascinating with Francesco and the MEPP program. Uh, I guess I'll be asking Professor Lee my questions because he's my supervisor. <laughs> um, do you think that the rise of the far right in Europe and in the European Parliament could lead to a sort of similar situation that we see in the United States where Congress gets blocked when they're trying to send weapons and, and aid to Ukraine? And there's a sort of a deadlock. Do you think that that similar situation will arise in the EU and that you will have a deadlock? Hi, my name is Robert. I have many thoughts, but I'll just keep it at one for now. Um, I guess I would direct it to Professor Lee in terms of accessibility to commission. I was quite curious to hear your thoughts on, um, I'm, I know I'm butchering his name, but um, the commissioner, um, Gary Breton, he made remarks a few days ago about. Um, Ursula von der Leyen's candidacy and the weakness of that candidacy. And I was curious how common it is for a commissioner to criticize um, the, um, the candidacy of an incoming, potentially incoming, or someone who's running to get a second mandate as president of the commission. Is that common? And how would you assess um, Ursula von der Leyen's um, prospects at a second mandate? Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, so we have first Harrison question, Harrison's question on uh, social media, the right wing rise and uh, related voter mobilization um, and how the right wing is doing uh, when compared to the liberals, who should we mobilize first? Um, then uh, Francesco, this question is directed uh, to Michael Lee um, about the right wing rise and whether this will lead to a uh, deadlock like in the United States. And finally, Robert, uh, also directed to you um, on uh, Thierry Breton and his um, argument that uh, a second von der Leyen candidacy might be weak and what her prospects are. Um, may I, yeah, I will I will maybe hand to, to uh, Rector de Hoos uh, first and then to to Hannah and Professor Baldini on the first question, and we'll leave them to Michael. Thank you. Thank you. With your permission, I'll pick and choose yes. a little yes, few yes. <laughs> questions that, that, that were uh, raised uh, because they speak to uh, one another, I think. Um, how do you mobilize voters? That's a big question. Uh, there are multiple ways of doing so. One is to find good candidates, that are strong personalities that appeal to those. Mm -hmm. In multiple ways uh, to a large number of people, and uh, that that's what lies behind uh, at least the the idea of the Spitzenkandidat to to find somebody who can speak to uh, a very diverse constituency. There's another approach, which is to focus on specific issues and to tell people you care about climate change. Well, vote for parties or candidates that want to go in the direction you want to go, whichever that is. Uh, you care about migrations, <laughs> same discourse. And these are two topics that are highly Europeanized in different ways. And the change, I mean, the policy largely originated in Brussels. Uh, migration is not, uh, but that's the opposite. Um, there, there's little you can achieve if you don't have a pan-European policy. So in both cases, 
uh, the issue is actually Europeanized, and uh, I think voters now start to realize this. This is why they will mobilize, but in ways that I cannot predict. I mean, I think it will make all the different options. Deadlock. Uh, that's a very good question because it points at uh, really the the idea of a, a chain of command that would unite the, the ballot that voters put in the box and the action of the the Brussels machinery. We know that the chain of command is uh, not quite perfect in part because of the um, of, of the electoral system, but. It's not the only uh, reason for that. There, uh, there, there are multiple elements in the decision-making system at the European level, which make it almost indispensable to have a grand coalition bringing together representatives, not only of a large number of countries, but of a large number of parties. Uh, and typically, if you look at the majorities in the European Parliament, you would see that uh, to achieve... Uh, uh, let's say, to, to, to adopt a position in legislative procedures, uh, the European Parliament uh, needs a majority of members and, uh, and not only of those voting. And that makes a big difference. That explains, for instance, why, uh, to, to many people's surprise, uh, one of the most frequent uh, majorities in the European Parliament actually is a majority where all groups vote in the same manner. So it's not as polarized as it could be, uh, and, and certainly not as it is in, in the US Congress for the time being. Is it good? Is it bad? I mean, we pay a price in, in that it, it weakens uh, the, uh, the, the command chain, as I say. But let's think of the alternative. If we had a first past the post electoral system and simple majority within the institution, would the EU survive? If you had a, a right-wing uh, majority in Parliament and therefore a right-wing commission imposing a right-wing uh, policy line, I think uh, uh, the uh, the Union would not resist in, in this kind of polarization. Uh, this uh, is not uh, uh, an integrated super state. It's a union of states and, and therefore a multi-level system in which it's important to have uh, checks and balances. That's the big question. How to uh, to, let's say, preserve the stability through checks and balances on the one hand, and uh, while at the same time uh, allowing for some kind of citizen input and responsiveness from the institutions. Uh, mm -hmm. Nobody has a perfect solution to that question. But after all, if you look at the, uh, you know, the mother of all constitutions, it can't be said that for the time being it functions <laughs> in a very satisfactory manner either. So, uh, uh, <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, Hannah, do you have something to add? Uh, because Harrison was um, asking about the German case a little bit more. Um, a couple of things that came to my mind is that obviously voting at the European level is different from voting at your local elections or uh, national elections, right? It feels a bit more removed, I think, and that's why it's easier to cast a protest vote. Um, so I think that's an effect that cannot be underestimated when you look at this. Um, I, you also said liberal voters, and I guess you mean liberal voters in a general left-wing sense, but I'm going to speak specifically about the FDP instead, um, uh, which was really interesting because they did quite well at the last national elections in Germany with the general message of change, innovation, de-bureaucratization, and so forth. Um, right now, the coalition is crumbling a tiny bit, so they may not be believable anymore. But I think that that can be a nice model if you're trying to reach out to voters, be they disillusioned or not, um, the younger ones, I think, will respond well to these kinds of messages if there's a proven winning strategy in some sense. Um, and it was a big surprise then. I think it, it could be a good uh, thing to model campaigns on right now. Who to target them to? I think I I think I don't know if anybody knows the demographics well enough. I, so I think I'd leave it at that. Thank you so much. Professor Pildini, do you have something yeah. to add? Uh, yes, a lot has been said already, but I would just point to the question of turnout, which is, of course, very difficult, also because we should never forget that basically in our, in three out of the six founding members, there was compulsory voting, and, uh, and turnout has been declining constantly since 79, and uh, it has, it's, this, this, uh, this decline has at least been arrested over the last two general elections, two European elections, sorry. 
So something has been done, and the same uh, specific candidatum procedure has been somehow helpful, I, I would say. Let's also never forget that in Eastern Europe, there are countries where turnout is lower than 20%. And one might wonder, how would the rest of the people would vote if they go to the polls? This is just a joke, but you know, we can, we can guess that some of the people who don't go to the polls is just because they would express, you know, a, a Euroskeptic vote, which is also problematic in itself. But uh, it has always been difficult to address the question of turnout because behind this, there is a lot of different things. There is this interest, there is lack of information, there is a, a distant parliament, as Mark was saying before. So there are a lot of things. And, and also the question of, you know, Italian candidates possibly be running without actually going to the parliament, which is, you know, in itself a disgrace in many ways. So it doesn't really help because, you know, you could even mobilize people, but some people might uh, just say, you know, why are these people running if they can't really go there? So what's the issue? Okay, so it's a, it is indeed a difficult game. Thank you so much, Professor Paulini. Um, I will hand over to you, um, Mr. Lee, to answer Francesco's and, and Robert's questions. Well, thank you. Francesco, your question whether um, the far right, if they strengthen their position in the European Parliament, could could block, um, as we've seen, blockages in the American uh, Congress. I feel a little bit uneasy about the confidence with which pollsters and others predict basically no real change in the control of the European Parliament and the other main institutions. I quite agree that on the basis of the public opinion polls that have been run, the European Council of Foreign Relations and others, this is indeed the way it looks. But haven't we been there before? You know, I mean, we've been there, wasn't, uh, didn't Hillary Clinton have a 90% chance, you know, of winning <laughs> in 2016 uh, and, and so on. I'm sure these calculations are well-founded, but supposing, I mean, in our course, we're doing scenarios, right? I mean, you could make a scenario without attaching a probability to it, in which in reality, the two main uh, far-right groups do even better than is foreseen, and that they overcome their differences. Highly unlikely, uh, given all the, the, the circumstances, but for the purposes of a scenario that would have more than zero uh, probability, I think it's worth thinking about. In any event, they could decide to vote tactically together, whether or not they actually get together to become a largest group on key matters. And they also have to approve the commission. I mean, in the past, commissioners have only been rejected on the grounds, broadly speaking, of moral turpitude, but they can object to commissioners. And if they see another commission dominated by the EPP, as well as the socialists who will have lost votes and the Greens who will have lost votes and so on, they might not like it. And when they come to hearings in the European Parliament, they might get stroppy, who knows? So, I mean, I feel a bit uneasy being as confident as most commentators are that we're more or less going to go on the same way. And there are circumstances in which not a blocking majority, but they could make life sort of really hard. Um, Robert's question about um, these critical comments uh, by uh, Boré, the high representative, vice president of the commission, about um, Ursula von der Leyen uh, and Thierry Breton. I think one has to think about coalition governments in Europe in general and what happens at election time. Because, you know, uh, election uh, coalitions are cobbled together. Um, Germany always has a coalition government. Belgium always have a coalition government. And they stick together more or less during the period of office. But when elections come, it's fairly normal that they should take their own positions. Now, whether actually a personal attack, you know, on the president of the commission in which you are still serving, I mean, you haven't gone on leave for the purposes of the election. Um, I think it does go a bit over the top by European practice. I think the reason was, um, you know, she doesn't consult very much. I mean, she's been very effective, Ursula von der Leyen, but this is really top down sort of one woman government in the commission. And I think she announced, thinking that it would go down well in electoral terms, that in the next commission, there would be a commissioner for defense for the first time. So here's Boré saying, wait a minute, I am the high commission for security and for foreign policy and security. Why didn't you ask me about this? 
And Thierry Breton saying, but look, I'm already in charge of industry, including the defense industry. So what's this new person going to do? So this was sort of behind their back and they felt bad about it. And so they felt justified in making this kind of attack. But still, I think in the European context, it's a bit less shocking, shocking than having a cabinet officer yeah. in the United States suddenly attacking the president in whose government. <laughs> and I just, yeah, there's no such thing as elective cabinet responsibility at, uh, at the commission level in the EU. Thank you very much. May I yes. just add one line, which is, didn't we say we want more politicization? Yeah, sure. but that's <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, are there any further questions? We have about, or comments, we have about 15 minutes left. I have a question in response to something that President Lee said with the response. Yes. Confident answering this about some, this, about that seems like a correlation between. Um, your skepticism and, and pro Moscow uh, attitude. I was wondering for any additional thoughts on to what extent it's realistic to assume that Moscow is actually actively trying to exercise some, some control, at least through some uh, uh, rather good parties with accusations for some of these amendments. And, and if that's uh, the case at all, how likely it would be to actually uh, serve its own interests. Thank you very much. I think there's another question here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Max. I have a question related to something that uh, Hannes spoke about. You referred to the uh, far right parties and specifically the AFD as uh, a vanguardist in, in, uh, in their efforts of mobilizing young voters through uh, social media. And Professor Gilbert and his, and his comment also hinted at their general success at mobilizing voters, whether online or offline. Uh, why do you think? Uh, um, these far right parties uh, have been uh, so um, pioneering in their um, in their social media, uh, media usage. Um, and one common narrative that you hear from these kinds of political forces is that they're they're often vilified or neglected neglected by their uh, respective uh, mainstream uh, medias in their respective countries, and that's why they sort of organically resorted to these kind of uh, channels. Uh, what do you make of that uh, narrative? And um, why do you think the political competition has been so weak in responding uh, to these kind of efforts directed to Hannah, but also maybe Professor Gilbert and Professors, uh, Professor Prozini from Dublin, if they wish. Anybody? Thank you. Maybe we could like a third question from the back, yeah. My question is for Professor Prozini. You said you're not a fan of the proportional electoral system. Uh, which electoral system would you see as a possible substitute for this if a potential reform would uh, happen? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, may I start by directing um, Jalis? question to you, um, Lee, on Euroscepticism and the correlation to uh, pro-Moscow influence um, and, and whether there is a respective influence. Well, one of the reasons why we hope that it will be difficult for these parties to get together is that some of them lean in that direction and others, such as Fratelli d'Italia, are strong supporters of, of NATO uh, and of Ukraine. So I think this means that um, it's unlikely that we're really going to see a rapprochement between all of these parties. I mean, several of them have very clear and historic positions um, as far as relations with Moscow are concerned. I mean, Marine Le Pen, uh, pretty clear. Uh, she's trying to get away from it now, but loans previously to her party from a, a bank, uh, which she repaid eventually, and so on. And more generally, links with Moscow, um, the Lega, uh, Fidesz, uh, FICO in Slovakia, and others. I don't think Russia has to intervene actively in order for those parties to 
maintain their broad positions, critical about the war, and so on. That's not to say that they're not practicing their usual bag of tricks, whether deep fakes, uh, various forms of uh, interference um, uh, on, the, on the social media. I, I would expect them to continue that as usual. But um, I don't think their interference is necessary for those particular parties' orientations to be what they are. Thank you very much. Um, maybe we switch to the to, to the question on social media and uh, the far right, especially the AFD. Um, Hannah, would you like to start, and then we hand over to Professor Hilberg. Um I don't think that the claim about the mainstream media abandoning them and they have to. Uh, be innovative is fair. I mean, Obama massively innovated on social media outreach, right? And he's not right wing. So I think that's it's it's deliberate targeting. I think it's a strategy that they are employing, and I think that the establishment parties, quote unquote, have simply fallen behind on it, as happens, especially if you are in government for sixteen years, more or less. A kind of stagnation of innovation under Merkel in more than one area, I think, in Germany at least, is to blame. Um, I cannot really speak to other European countries, but I'd be curious to hear opinions if there's anyone. Well, I'm not going to answer the social media one as somebody who is the least socially connected person in the universe. I, 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 I to, to say one obvious thing, uh, they can lie. It makes it easier to lie, right? Um, and I think this is something that unscrupulous political parties engaged in what they regard as a crucial political competition tend to do. Uh, whether we should have a system, whether we should allow social media to have such power in a democracy that you can have a situation where really quite uh, egregious untruths are diffused very, very quickly is something I think we all need to start thinking about. You know, I'm teaching in my course on democracy and discontents. There should probably be a lesson on that subject, frankly. And it's only the fact I'm very inexpert that makes me not do it. But generally speaking, I thought, Max, the second part of your question was really more interesting, and it comes back to what I was saying before. Why is political competition so weak? It's, it's interesting. Uh, I agree with uh, Renaud. Uh, normally, more politics. Let's have more politics. Uh, I think democracies thrive when there's heated debate, when, there's, uh, when ideas are being argued out and people are striving to get their views across. Uh, but what happens when the establishment parties are defending a status quo in a perhaps somewhat lackluster way? I, I actually think that one of the things, one of the lessons we've learned from recent elections across Europe is that too often uh, the establishment parties have been too lackluster and it's impossible. I've been striving my best throughout this entire evening not to use the B word and mention Brexit. But one of the problems with Brexit and the reason why Brexit won was the, the, the opponents of the European Union were, were filled with passion and were prepared to work long hours and go out and vote. Whereas the people who are in favor of staying in the European Union were frankly pretty lackluster about defending what they believed in. And I think you see this again and again in country after country. Uh, I think the answer to your question is a bit of a circular argument in some way. Why is political competition so weak? Because the people are not competing hard enough, is the answer. And if you really believe in the European People's Party's views, if you really believe in social democratic views, if you really vote in Liberal Party views, well, you need more civic engagement. I, I hope that doesn't seem like a hopelessly circular argument, but I think it's the truth. Thanks, Gilbert. Um, are there any questions online? There aren't. No. No, there but aren't. Can I answer the question oh, on, the, on, on the election? Oh, just a quick comment to our Tifoso del Milan. Um, obviously, one of the elements that come in, comes into play with regard to these parties is also that uh, wave of populism that we've had. And when I when I use the term populism, I adhere to the definition of Jan Werner Müller. Uh, you are an elite. You're enemies of the people. We represent the people. And this idea 
of this uh, uh, people that is one and that is represented by the by, by these parties. And anyone that's against them is against the people. In my opinion, profoundly illiberal, but it's certainly a successful alongside, I think, some important things that Mark said in terms of the very simple messages that uh, these uh, uh, parties are getting across. The problem, simplicity versus complexity, is a is it's a big topic. The, the the capacity of concentration, I would almost say, of the voters is very short, and therefore uh, we've got to find a way. Uh, the rector is right. Finding charismatic uh, politicians who are, however, competent politicians able to get a complex message over in the most simple way possible because otherwise voters are just not going to listen to you thanks for the question about the electoral system let me let me be a little more precise uh i think Renault is right when he says that a pure first past the post electoral system for european elections would probably not work although i think there is an interesting counterfactual what would have happened not so much now i think if if the if the if the radical right today were to win the elections it probably would be the end of the eu but let's go back 20 25 years and if we've had a sort of conservative uh, majority winning then who knows whether that would have been the end of the eu or would it have been a slightly different eu to the one where we're thinking about now it's a counterfactual but that would have been interesting but the thing about the electoral system is it's it's the issue of pure pr and who are, who who do i have it with in particular hannah bear with me the federal constitutional court of germany back in in 2011 when it said that no 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 thresholds for elections to the european parliament why? Because it doesn't matter if it's a very fragmented political system at European, uh, the European Parliament level, they don't have to express a government. Now, that's an issue because I think that by intervening and having an electoral system where there are thresholds, and I go back to my mentioning the Spanish system, it can be proportional electoral, proportional representation, but in small electoral districts where you know who the candidate is, that could make a difference, of course, alongside what has been said previously, good candidates, and then something that we haven't addressed, but we couldn't address everything, pan-European political parties. Because when we talk about the European People's Party, that's just a little symbol in some of the symbols of the parties at, at, at national level. There'll be a little EPP in Forza Italia's uh, logo at the elections, correct? We if I'm mistaken, what we need are pan-European political parties. Of course, we're still a long distance from that. Oh no, just no, no, it's a, no, no, it's just a quick, uh, quick comment on this because, yeah, I agree. This is a, an important point, and that in terms of the thresholds, you, could, you, I mean, you, th that judgment was a bit. Yeah, as you said, I mean, I, I agree with that point. At the same time, there is also an argument on the thing that, depending on the size, on how many seats you have to elect in each in each country, of course, this affects proportionality of the system a lot. So it's mainly a matter of the major member states, because if you go to small sure, states, that's sure. the proportionality, of course, is affected by the assembly size, so to speak. Uh, but that's going to be very difficult to have pan-European parties. It's, 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 it's hugely problematic for the, for the ways and the reasons we said before. So I, I also wish we could go in that direction, but it, it's, it's hugely complicated. Thank you very much. Are there any last questions? Otherwise I would come up with, uh, with a little question myself for the last five minutes we have. Professor Fusini, is there anything? Oh, sorry. I just have a quick point. <laughs> sorry, sorry. No speaking. Yeah. No. <laughs> I just, just, I just to bring an American perspective to like the conversation on politics and involvement. Obviously, no one wants to say this out loud, but the idea that more involvement is necessarily a positive thing, I think it's questionable. I think there's this danger of polarization. And I think from my perspective, one of the strengths of the European project thus far has been the lack, and yes, there's exceptions, obviously Brexit, other cases as well, but has been, to my, in my perspective, 
a lack of polarization, a lack of division on the question of Europe in many um, contexts. And I think the possibility of pan-European parties, uh, more involvement, more youth engagement brings the danger of 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 a growth in Euroscepticism. I don't know. This is I know this is a very loaded question, but I think that's just something to keep in mind. Yeah, I don't know what to spell. It's like, no, I was say it's an interesting point. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is what what I was what I was saying before in terms of Eastern Europe. I mean, we don't really have huge evidence that says you know what are the rest of the people who are not turning out thinking. But, you know, there you have a percentage of people that go to the polls, which is 20, 30, 40 percent. But there is a there is a point in what you say, basically. And uh, so because we have been here before, I mean, if I look back five years, we were in the same situation. I took five I, two debates, which were basically same, just saying the same things that we're saying now. If these two groups get together, what will happen? Would the EU be over in many ways? And so I, I hope we're going to be in the same position also after the election where we've been after 2019. Grounds up there. <laughs> yes. Can I? Just a few words. Uh, I've just written, finished writing a book about how Christian democracy led Italy to democracy in the post-war period. Alcide de Gasperi rather thought that uh, politics, that the aim of democracy, the end of democracy, was democracy itself. He thought it was vitally important that you committed yourself to the process of democracy and that uh, you had an engaged citizen, citizenry who was prepared to commit itself to democracy. Now, the European project has been, to a very large extent, I don't know whether what Sir Michael will say about this, but I, it has sometimes come across as being top-down and technocratic, but the goal of the European project has always been precisely that of having a union with activists, with, 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 with Europeans expressing their political views, perhaps even, God forbid, eventually in some sort of federal state. Now, you can't get that unless you have political engagement. People have got to commit themselves politically, even if this means they might lose. Even if this means they might lose. That's what democracy is all about. And I think the European Parliament, I think, so is the Europe is the purpose of the European Parliament uh, European Parliament to express European values, the parties that support the project, or is it the values and opinions of Europeans? And if it's the latter, which I think it should be, then it's up to you, it's incumbent upon you to make sure you win elections and to make sure that you can get your views across to the voters. I, mean, I think one of the things in Western democracies over recent years is the parties of the centre, liberal parties, Christian Democrat parties, social democratic parties, conservative parties, I'm mildly conservative in my political views myself, have been less and less good at communicating their often very sensible policies to voters. Well, you know, uh, I, I, you probably noticed a recurrent theme in my interventions in this thing. I, this is the task. So I, I'm not sure I agree with you, Robert. I, I think political passivity uh, is a tempting thing to fall back on, but I don't believe that we, if we're serious about building Europe, which I for one certainly am or would be if they would let me vote, uh, is something that you can, you, I don't think you can rely on a technocratic union. I genuinely don't. I think Europe has got to prove its value at the ballot box. Uh, uh, this is my opinion. Thank you, Professor Gilbert. I think those were wonderful concluding remarks. I thank you very much. Um, I would like to thank the panelists and the audience for your lively participation. Thank you so much. And, um, have a lovely evening in Bologna. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, I just think that like, if you look at the US, you have a higher participation of the public.